have good food. Father, we thank you for this time together. I, we, we invite your presence. We don't take it for granted, Lord, that you're here, but we come to be refreshed, to be renewed. We come expecting to be used of you. Lord, I pray for those that come with a heavy heart. I pray for those, Lord, that come with physical ailments. Lord, you're the God that healeth us. Whether it be physically, emotionally, spiritually, or mentally, you're the God that healeth us. We welcome that in this service today. We've come to worship the King of Kings. We've come to declare your lordship over our lives and over every portion of our lives. Lord, we take a moment to pray for Ukraine, the brothers and sisters that are in Ukraine. We pray for peace over that land. We pray, Lord God, that you send angels to protect our brothers and sisters that are in Ukraine and our missionaries that are in Ukraine. We pray, Lord God, that the government or our government would begin to recognize that we need to produce what you've already given us. It's already below us. That we begin to reproduce, we begin to pull out again what you've given us. So that we would not be dependent and others would not be dependent on godless rulers and godless nations. And so, Lord, I pray that you move in those in authority. And, Lord, I, I boldly just declare, Lord, I take authority in the name of Jesus. And we do this for those that agree. We do this in the name of Jesus against a cult. And I believe it's a cult. No, it's not even a cult. It's witchcraft that believes they can, they're, they're here to save the planet. That they are chosen to stop global warming or cooling, which has been going on since you created heaven and earth. So, Lord, I, I come against that, that lie that, that, that ruins people's lives, that holds people in bondage. And I pray, Lord, this nation, in the name of Jesus, would wake up to who you are, to the gifts that you've given us, Lord, to the blessings you've poured out upon us, that we might be responsible stewards of all that you've given us. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, this morning. And everybody who agreed said, amen. Good morning.
you, Father. Never forsake us. Your love never fails. That's right. Amen. His love never fails. Jesus promised he'd never leave us, never forsake us. Us, on the other hand, <laughs> so often when times get tough, we start looking, how can we solve this on our own? When the storms rise, the waves crash around us, and we start looking for, I don't know, we start looking for some wood to build our own boat. Yeah. When he's got a life ring right there for us. Yeah. He's reaching out to us. He's always right there. Amen. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. That's right. But we're always looking to solve our own problems, our own ways. And usually we just make it worse. We end up like the prodigal son sleeping with the pigs. <laughs> and we have to come home to, to daddy and ask forgiveness and get a bath. Yeah. Get cleaned up and get set back up on our own two feet. In his arms, he comes running to us. So wouldn't it be great to just shortcut that whole thing and just hold on to him? He's holding on to us. Can we hold on to him yeah. instead of having to go stub our toes, fall in the mud, do all that stuff first before we come back? Yeah. So, Lord, we come today and we declare you are Lord. Yes, you we are Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you never leave us. You never forsake That's us. That's right. Thank you. And we declare, Lord. We want to hold on to you, not go our own way, not seek our own things, yes. not seek our own solutions. But, Lord, we want to be planted in your word, planted in your house amongst your people and clinging to you. In Jesus' name.
thank you that you've given us life. Everything comes from you. All that we have, all that we are. We come today, Lord, to declare your greatness. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
You're the only one who's worthy of our praise. The only one who's worthy of glory. The only one who's praise worthy of honor. Praise you. Thank you, Lord. You set us free. Can anyone testify that God touched your lungs during that song? And that God touched your sinuses and someone with a right leg, the ankle down by their ankle has been healed in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your moving and your power right now. Lord, let them receive that healing. Lungs open in Jesus' name. Lungs you open now in Jesus' name. Sinuses release. We release you in Jesus' name. And the pain in the bones and the ankles and the knees. Be healed. In Jesus' name, be healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You unravel me. With a melody, you surround me with the song of deliverance from my
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. works on fear, operates out of fear, operates out of, it's coming to an end, it's burning up, it's cooling off, um, you, you, what, what fear is it? Your kids aren't going to get saved, you're not going to have money, you name the fear, and you've all got them, something that you need to begin to trust God in, I'm no longer a slave to fear, and I, wanna, I want just you take a minute. And allow the Holy Spirit, because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to set some people free. But it's going to be dependent upon whether you're going to acknowledge this is an area in your life that you're tripping up over. Or whether you're going to sit there and say, well, I can handle this on my own. God wants to set you free. He's come that we might be set free. And the reality is, that we have to acknowledge His power and His might to set us free. Amen. And I want you to just take a moment. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to take a moment. And some of you are bound up in some fear. There's, and I, I do not know what it is, but I do know that there's some that are bound up in fear. It cripples a part of your life. It comes back to you in the night. And, and you need to just identify it Maybe it's something you've done and, and you're, you're afraid it's going to get exposed. You need to give it to God. And as we begin to sing this song, and we're going to sing it again, you're going to make declaration, Lord, that, Father, I give this to you. I want to be set free. I will no longer be bound by fear. Fear will not manipulate me. Fear will not move me. Fear will not seize me. Fear will not freeze me. I am a child of God. Amen. And I will not be condemned. I will not be coerced. I will not be cornered by fear. I am free in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know what it is. And if you want to be free, then you need to take the time and just mumble in your heart, Lord, I ask that you free me. I give this to you. I no longer will try to figure it out. I will no longer try to work it out. I will give it to you, Lord. And you will take it. I repent of it, Lord. And now let's sing, I am free. I'm no longer. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the sound of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I no longer Let it go. Acknowledge it and release it. Acknowledge it and give it to God. It's God.
Lord would say to some this morning, I am going before you and I am preparing you a way. What I open, no man can shut. And what I shut, no man can open. I believe the Lord is saying to another this morning, I will provide. I will provide all your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Lord. You need to receive it. You need to thank the Lord for it. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I hope you brought your Bibles, and I hope you're in the habit of bringing your Bibles. I hope you're in the habit of reading the Word of God daily. Um, I'd like you to follow along. One of the things through my years of going to church is that I was able to mark up my Bible. Now, I remember when I got a, a young man got saved, and Catch a can, and he was uh, uh, brought up in a Jewish home. He was Jewish, and he, the Holy Spirit revealed to him who Jesus was, the Messiah, and he got absolutely gloriously saved. I mean, this kid got saved. And so he went out and bought me, and it's very expensive, uh, the Jewish first five books and a couple others with the commentary. It's very thick, hardback. And it was, I knew immediately he was moving out of town. He wanted to present me with this. And I made the huge mistake of saying, would you sign it? Poor kid almost lost his salvation. <laughs> you do not write in the Word of God. You make sure your hands are clean and washed before you turn the pages. So I now give you permission to write in your Bibles. Okay, do not change words or phrases but you can highlight and put stuff. If you look at mine, I, uh, I, it's, it's highly written. And I, one of the things for those of us who've been Christians for a while, we write in our Bibles, we read them, and they start to fall apart. And eventually, we've got to get a new one. And just, you know, you're just going, oh, man, oh, man. And I remember the last time was about eight years ago that I had to get a new one. And I was just... God, we can, we can get this fixed up. I've got all this important dates, and I've got all these prophecies, and I've got all these, you know, here. And the Lord says, just get another one. We'll fill that one up too. And so if anybody knows uh, somebody that can bind books back together, I'm sort of falling apart, but uh, he hasn't told me I have to get a new one yet. <clears throat> got your Bibles? I'm going to look at, at, at three, how Father God feels about you. I want to talk about what God's heart is towards you and me. How Father God feels about you. I'm going to have four points on this. We're going to look at a whole chapter. It's going to be Luke the 15th. It's probably, we're going to look at the most famous of all parables. But we're going to look at the two preceding parables, parables, and we're going to look at why these parables are addressed. Why Jesus is talking about them. Luke 15. The parable of the prodigal son, recorded here in Luke 15, is often called the parable of the father's heart. That's what we're going to talk about. Others call it about the parable of two lost sons, because it does talk about two lost sons. Jesus tells it along with two other parables, not only in response to the seemingly heartless religionists of the day, but also he tells these parables so that you and I will get to know the father's heart towards us. Luke 15 starts off with, the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, saying, the man receives welcome sinners and eats with them. So Jesus spoke these parables to them. The very reason, he tells us why they're being spoken, because the Pharisees are complaining that Jesus mixes with sinners. Sinners were the immoral or those who followed occupations that, religious, that the religious regarded as incompatible with the law. There are people who had just gave up with trying to follow all the rules and regulations and never measured up, never felt they were good enough, couldn't do it. I know a lot of people who went to church for a lot of years and finally they just gave up. They said, I'll never be like so-and-so, I'll never get it, there's too many rules. You know, we need to understand Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about 
leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. We've got way too many rules that were man-made, and we need to let them go. One of the accepted pharisaical rules that was at that time um, is one must not associate with ungodly men. In fact, it was so accepted, Peter believed it. Because in Acts 10, where Peter goes into Cornelius' house, here's what he says. He said to them, you know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate or even visit a Gentile. Yet God has shown me that I should call no person defiled or ritually unclean. Wow. Even the apostles hung on to their man-made rules until God shook them free. And when they said he was eating with sinners, well, that's doubly worse. For by eating with them, you're implying you welcome and give them recognition. I don't know. It's hard to, in my estimation, to help sinful people if you do not acknowledge them. You ever know somebody that could tell you the weather by the slant of their nose? They just got their nose in the air so high. And it's always looking down at you. And, and, and it's hard to relate to people when you're looking down at them. Amen? I love the... the, the it, Ethan's going crazy because I'm way off notes. Um, I love the fact where it says in 1 Corinthians, he lists all these things, murderers, this, that, all these other things. And uh, he lists all these, these things of sin, and these will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And at the end of that, after this long list of things that, that you know, are going to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven, he says, of such were you and I. Recognizing that, you know, if we'll love people, we can love them to life. Because we changed, and we need to be honest enough to say, at one time, as such, was I. Back to the sermon. That was just freebie on the side. The first parable of the lost sheep speaks, God of, uh, uh, speaks of God speaking, seeking out that lost, wandering sheep. It's the 1%. If you'll notice, the three parable goes 1%, 10%, 50%. That's how mine my works when I see these things. One percent is he goes out after that sheep that wandered away. The 99 are safe. He comes, goes out, looks at it. Now, what's interesting is you would think that when he found that one sheep, he would just take his staff and come on, let's go home. And the sheep would follow him home, but it doesn't. What does the Bible say? It says he picked up that sheep and he put it on his shoulders and he carried it home. Why? Because sheep are the stupidest animals that ever lived on this planet. And such are you and I at times. The reality is a sheep, when they get scared, will just sit down. When they're lost or confused, they just sit down. I've told the story of our neighbors went on vacation, and they had a couple of three sheep in their yard, and we had acres of nice tall grass. You know, we had a front yard mowed and that kind of stuff, but all around us was, was nice grass, and they just had this dirt patch, no bigger than half this sanctuary. And they had those three, and we were supposed to watch after their sheep. And so, okay, I can do that. And, and, I, and I felt bad because, man, I got all this grass over here, and they got dirt over there. I know what I'll do. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bring them over to my grass and stake them out there. So I took the first one, and, and it followed me over. And then I, I uh, went to take the, the, I went to take the, the U over, and... She laid down right in the middle of the road. I mean, she laid down right, just right there. Big, fat you. She just sat right there. I tried getting grass. I tried to do the uh, uh, Hansel and Gretel thing. You know, where you're, you're laying out the grass so it'll come after you. Nope, didn't do any good. I tried screaming. I, you know, <clears throat> unfortunately, I kicked it. I don't think I was saved at the time. I yarded on that thing. I did everything I possibly could to get that. And it's just going to lay there until some Mack truck hit it. But I was, no, it didn't. The truck didn't hit it. 
<laughs> there was a time I'd have called somebody to bring a Mack truck and hit that stupid thing. But it would not move. When they're scared, when they're, they're uncomfortable with their surroundings, where they don't know where they're at, they've wandered away, and that sheep just wandered away. They just nibble, 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 and all of a sudden they stick up their head and go, where's everybody at? And, and I had taken one, so I didn't know what to do. So what I did is I grabbed the littlest one, the little, the, the little lamb, and I let it sniff its mother, and then I kept walking. At the moment I started walking across, she jumped up and followed me across. But that all said was, I could have put sticks of dynamite under that thing's derriere and it would not have moved. <clears throat> Jesus recognizes the sheep is scared. He recognizes it's lost. And it's, the Bible says I pick, he picks it up, puts it on his shoulders, and he carries it back. That's what Jesus does once in a while to you and I. See, there's times we get out there and we get lost and we don't know what's going on and we're scared and we just sit down. We know we should run back. We know we should come back to fellowship. We know we should come back to church. We know we should come back to relationship with Jesus Christ, but we don't. It might be shame. It might be fear. It might be anxiety. You name it. But Jesus will come and pick you up if you want to come home. And he says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than those 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What's interesting, the word joy there means, it's, it, it, in, in the way that it's conveyed, it carries the idea that joy is to be shared with others. That joy is to be announced. The second one is the widow who loses one coin, one out of ten. Now, the houses in that day didn't have windows, if they did, they were tiny windows because they had to keep the houses warm. It says she lit a lamp. She swept and sifted the dust until she found that coin. Her life savings went with the other nine. And they rejoiced. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The joy to be shared. Both speak to the celebration in heaven when some lost soul repents. Here's an interesting thing. Do we rejoice when somebody comes to the Lord or do we go, okay, that's nice. Is there any joy in us when somebody actually comes to the Lord? Are we excited when people come to the Lord? No, is somebody we've been praying for? Maybe it's a relative. I'm like, yeah, but you know, folks, we need to be joy-filled and expecting when people come to the Lord. We need to have congratulations. We need to make a party out of it because heaven does. We need to rejoice when someone comes to the Lord. And the last parable, the one we're going to focus on this morning the most, and the most famous parable of all that Jesus speaks, is how the Father God feels about you and I. Jesus tells of a man with two sons the younger of whom asks for his inheritance in advance. Now remember who Jesus is talking to here, who these parables are for. And because of this, because of their complaints, because of this, because of the hardness of their heart, he tells them these three parables. Actually, there's a few more, um, if you'll understand in your Bible, that D Jesus didn't stop at 32 and say, chapter 16, he will start writing. No, he just... So th these parables, he's speaking to the Pharisees but he's letting the people know how much the father's heart is. Because he has the younger son who asks his inheritance in advance. Now, most of you understand that I, I've, I, I've studied this parable and I've, had, I've been privileged, absolutely privileged to study under um, the foremost Hebrew scholar in, in parables, and uh, at least today. And... He really brought this one out. You, you've heard me say that when Jesus said that the younger came and asked his dad for his inheritance, the air was taken out of the, out of the crowd. Absolutely unthinkable. Remember, he's talking to Pharisees and scribes. And I remember, he's just as insulted his dad. He just told his dad, why don't you drop dead and give me some money? I'm tired of being under your house. Drop dead, I want my inheritance. Now, According to the law, that son should be stoned. 
According to tradition, the older brother should have knocked him out because he's responsible for the younger brother's attitude and actions. So he's talking to the Pharisees, the legalists. They feel secure in their hardness of heart. They can't believe the next sentence. The father gives the inheritance to him. And the son went out and squandered. It was wasteful. Ended up in a pigsty. Finally, the Bible says, the young man came to himself. He recognized the insensibility of the pathway he'd been walking on and how foolish he'd been to leave home. He returned humbled, thinking he would just ask to be a servant in his father's house. Verse 20 to 24 give us the father's heart for you and I. It shows how much God is longing to live in relationship with you and I. But while he, that was the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran. Rich Jewish men never run. It's an anathema to their station in life. He ran, embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put him on him. And put a finger on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate with joy. And this the father's heart towards his son. Jesus also tells how Father God feels about you and I. Notwithstanding our failures and our wastefulness of what he's given to us, Ironically, this story, this parable, is born from the fact that those among them, the religious leader of Jesus' day, whom you would most think they understood God's love, there was the least evidence of God's love shown. Remember where a, that Jesus is assailed by the religious leaders because he was with the tax collectors, corrupt traitors in that society, sinners, a broad term for those who had no interest in religion. There's a lot of people out in this country that have no interest in religion because we've made religion convoluted. We've made it religion instead of relationship. We've made it rules and regulations instead of love and companionship. We've made it hard. When God says, I just want to love you. I just want to love you. But it's interesting because the tax collectors and the sinners, those who were not interested in religion, they liked hanging around Jesus. They didn't like hanging around the scribes or the Pharisees, but the Bible is clear. They liked Jesus. They followed Jesus. Because he didn't demonstrate religion. He shows people the heart and the love of the Father God. And their response to that demonstration of God's love was always, almost always, overwhelmingly possible. I'm going to say something that some of you may disagree or agree with right off. Jesus did not come for one reason, he came for two. Ooh, getting into heresy. Jesus came to die for our sins. And he came to display the love of Father God to each of us. 
Oftentimes, people think about Jesus' ministry displaying the love of God as a sort of a serpy kind of niceness. I was raised with that attitude that if you were a Christian, you couldn't have anything aggressive in you. You couldn't, uh, you, you, you had to tolerate, you had tons of rules. I mean, we had rules. We had buckets full of rules. I mean, we've all so we've been raised in the tradition. There's no drinking, there's no dancing, there's no card playing, there's no circus, there's no movies, there's no shows, there's no, I mean, you, but you can't go mix swimming. When you go to camp, girls have one time at the pool and boys have it another. I mean, the, the, the rules were endless. And, and it was just, I remember growing up thinking, Wow, my dad was strong. He, was, he, he loved the Lord and he was extremely strong, but I always saw him as a pacifist. And there's nothing wrong with that at certain times. Most of you know the story that I, when I got saved, I went to Old Oak Ranch to a couple's camp. And I knew it was going to be religious and I knew they were going to be weird. Because Pentecostals always are. Now, I was tricked into going there because they told me that it was a sports camp. Huh. So I loaded up my brick of hash and my bags of weed and stayed high the whole time. But one of the first days I got there, I met a young man, a middle-aged man, burly, big burly guy, probably 6'4", strong as an ox. We play volleyball. If you've ever been to Old Oak Ranch, their volleyball cart then was concrete, that concrete with rocks in it. And side walls were, were rock. It was like, ever see those pictures of those uh, Aztec or India? They'd play a game, they'd have a hoop over here and a hoop over here, and you'd try to kick it through the hoop. And, and that's just, you were in this, this pit, almost a mosh pit. Well, the way that Dave played it was a mosh pit. And I remember one of the first things, the ball was coming near me, he ran me over. And I mean, he ran me, he laid me out. Now, I played the year before, I mean, I, back that year I played college football. And he laid me out. And I remember thinking, and he apologized, oh, I'm so sorry, I was just going for the ball, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I remember thinking, okay, sissy, let's see if you can take it. And so I just waited, waited my chance. I waited until the ball got within 20 yards of him. And I got a running head start, and I just nailed him. Nailed him on the side, sent him into the concrete, screeching across. Got the ball, leaned down, went, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you there. I don't know what I expected, but the Lord used that incident, and the Lord used that man to shake me out of the concept that Jesus' ministry was syrupy. That Christians were pansies. Because he rolled over with bloody knees, took my hand, he goes, man, nice hit, let's go. And I watched him worship and I watched him play. And it meant, it changed my attitude and it changed my mind. Christianity is not for people who just, we always got to get along. There is a time to stand up. And, and I thank God for that. I, I, I'll always remember that. And I'll always be um, emotional because God flipped my mentality. He flipped my reasoning. Some of us need to have our reasoning flipped. We need to have our understanding of what being a Christian means. We need to understand what it means. Jesus came to die for our sins and to display the love of God. And that is to die on a cross. And 80% of us would have died before we ever got to the cross with the whipping and everything else that was inflicted. All too often we think Jesus' ministry is just by displaying the love of God as some sort of syrupy, kind, niceness. But there's nothing syrupy about God's love. It's dynamic, and God's love is powerful. 
God's love is deep and God's love is demanding. God's love is so demanding that he cannot simply let sin slide by unattended. And that's why he sent his son to absorb in himself, Jesus, the price of our sin. What we see in Jesus is the love of the Father. And the lifestyle of Jesus leads us, and in the graciousness with which he embraces people who have fallen, people who have failed, people who, like the prodigal son, have wasted something and were willing to honestly admit it. With that wastefulness, however, there comes a sense of unworthiness that distance people from God. It doesn't distance God from people, but the shame of waste, the shame of the years, the shame of the talent that we wasted and we knew that God gave us, a lot of people will distance themselves from God. God's not going to distance himself from them. But sin does that. Until we acknowledge it, repent from it, it'll attempt to distance us from God. The son went to a far country. He wasted his money. He wasted what he had been given as an inheritance. He wasted the giftings. And he came to himself. There often comes a a sense of unworthiness when we know we've wasted what God has given us. And Satan will then use that to keep us from God. Many people in Jesus' day were characterized by feeling of unworthiness. It's a shame-based society. And if you don't understand that, we'll talk sometime. I've talked quite a bit about the, the, the culture of that time is shame-based. Everything you did was not to bring shame on the family, and if you did bring shame on the family, then you were rejected. The Pharisee and the scribes who are listening to this parable, this story, is the son, as, as soon as the son left. First, I can't understand the dad didn't bring him to him because they would have stoned him to death. They'd have sat at the city gates and said, kill that little punk. Let him be an example to other kids not to smart off to his dad or wish his dad dead. That was their hard-heartedness. And then for the concept of the son to even be allowed back towards the farm, that's an, you don't do that. Their hearts are hard. That kid, that kid no longer belongs to the family. But how many times have we done something after we received Christ and we feel like we don't belong to the family anymore? We feel like we're a second-class citizen. We feel like that we're being rejected. And what has to happen in the church of Jesus Christ today is we've got to quit making people feel like that. We've got to quit making them. Even if they blow it big time, we've got to make sure that we welcome them back as the Father welcomes them back. With no bitter aftertaste, no condemnation, no name or shame, if they repent and come back, we need to receive them like their father receives them. But all too often, we don't. I remember when Jim Baker, now this is a name that some will know and some will not. It's a famous uh, TV televangelist, pretty much the, the start of the TV ministries. Turned out to be a lot of scam, a lot of fluff, a lot of sin. He wound up going to prison. Prison, he's abused. Came out and I listened to his testimony. Um, church in Four Square had him come and speak. And uh, I saw some other things where how dare them, how dare them let him come and speak. Don't they know who he is? Don't they know what he's done? How dare them? He's he's standing in their pulpit, crying, speaking, testifying of the pigsty that he wandered off to and the God that he came back to. It's an emotional, if you ever see it, 
It's Jack Hayford at Church on the Way. Embraces him. That takes a lot of daring or a lot of trust in God to, because we have a tendency as a church to avoid people who fall. We have a tendency to distance ourselves from saints who sin and get caught in sin. Lord, that should not be true among us. We should embrace them as willingly as the Father embraces them when they repent. They understood in that shame society And they would have kept a distance from the religious. And the religious leaders wouldn't have come near them. By the way, the Pharisees and Sadducees by this time, their head, scribes, their heads are spinning. What is he talking about? He's talking about the love of the Father's heart towards every one of us who at one or another time go astray. Maybe we don't go to a foreign country. Maybe we don't live in a pigsty but we walk away from the grace and the goodness of God. And so often, we only come back partially. We come back scared. But God, this parable says you need to come back for the Father has never lost hope in you. This is a parable that reveals four things about Father God that speak to there and our sense of unworthiness, failure, and distance from here. First, the Father never loses hope. God never loses hope. Did you have parents who were warm and supportive and encouraging? Parents who had hope for you and spoke kindly to you? Well, some didn't. Some even had parents who wished their children had never been born. And let me tell you, kids pick up on that sense of rejection. Others had parents who put expectations so high the kids could never live up to them. What's impressive about this text is that the son went against everything of the father's hopes. And yet the father still didn't lose hope for him. And that's the first message of Father God's hope for us. Notwithstanding anything, you or I have not been. God doesn't give up caring about us. Nor does he ever lose his vision for what we can become in him. He never loses hope in us. Second, the Father is always looking our way. I've joked about this, and I think some of us unfortunately have this within our mentality, is that we believe God is watching, all right, but he's watching just looking for an opportunity to hit us with a lightning bolt. He's looking for us to mess up so he can squish us, so he can show that he's God and we're not. I want to say this, if you or I feel that, it's because of our own sense of shame and guilt for what we've done. If you feel that God wants to get back at you, if you feel God's mad at you, it's because of our own sense of shame and guilt for what we've done. And by the way, I'm not going to say the guilt doesn't deserve to be felt, but it's not God's attitude towards us. When we knowingly break the rules, when we knowingly walk away from God, there should be some guilt. There should be some conviction. But it's not God's attitude that He's mad at us. He's always looking our way. The guilt does deserve to be felt, but it's not God's attitude towards us. It is our own sense of alienation because of our own sin, but that does not represent God's heart. 
God is not passive about the fact that we've sinned. That is why Jesus was sent to suffer and die. Sin has to be dealt, dealt with. And we need to repent of it. Not hide it. Not dress it up. Not try to excuse it. Not try to say, well, I'm the one person in eternity who is the exception to the rule. And we do those kind of things, and we feel guilt, and we feel alienation. That guilt and alienation is not coming from God. He's waiting us to repent so that the sin can be dealt with. We need to repent of it, acknowledge it, and leave it. But Jesus shows us the Father's heart towards us. In the story of how the Father saw his Son a great way off. The Father is always looking for us to come home. He's always looking for us to get up and to come back. And he saw his Son a great way off and he ran to meet him. I already said that in that day and age, for the, for, the, for the Pharisees and scribes, remember, they just sucked air again. He ran. First of all, he was even watching. This kid should have been alienated. He should have taken out the will and just marked out his name. But he was watching for him. He's watching for you and me in those areas where we need to repent and come back to him and let him heal us and embrace us. And he was a great way off and he ran to meet him. He didn't just stand and wait for the boy to come crawling and groveling home. Jesus tells us the father who had obviously been watching for him. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and he braced him and he kissed him. Loved ones, Father God's heart is always looking our way. And he's always reaching out to us if we will come his way. Number three, the Father's heart responds to our repentance. And this is very important. The Son comes with repentance. And the Father's heart responds. This can't be bypassed. Not because he's demanding the Son grovel for acceptance. But because he's glad his Son has come to recognize that the problem's the son has had, were not of his father's makings. I don't know how to put this, but a lot of people will come and they'll get caught in a sin or they'll get caught in something. Oh, I'm so sorry, man. I, you know, yeah, big. No, there, there needs to be genuine repentance, a turning away from that sin and coming back to God and acknowledging. There needs to be an acknowledging that we were wrong. That what we did was wrong before God. You don't have to stand up before the church. You and God or you and somebody else, they need to stand and get it before God. He's glad his son has come to recognize that the problem he had was not his father's fault. How often have you and I heard people say, if there is a God, why did this happen to me? Or if there is a God, why does that happen? God gets blamed for everything for which we don't want to accept responsibility. Want to hear me say that again? God gets blamed for everything for which we don't want to accept responsibility. Sickness and sin came into this world through Adam and Eve. It has progressed and compounded physically, mentally, emotionally down through the ages. It is not God's fault. the babies are born deformed. It's not God's fault that some tragedy happened in your life because you made a bad decision. When the prodigal son comes back, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Repentance is turning away from our own ways to God's ways. It is recognizing the fact that God's ways are good, safe, and secure for us. We al- when we align our life, it opens the way for Him to then release possibilities into our lives. 
for He loves us with an everlasting love. He doesn't quit loving us. He's always looking. He's always waiting. He's ready to respond to our repentance. He loves us with an everlasting love, an unconditional love. But for there to become the release of what He wants to do in us, we have to be willing to repent. Christians have got become very, very good at disguising, excusing, accepting exceptions to their sins. I'm Irish, so I can yell at you anytime I want. That's just the way I am, so I can be critical and demeaning to you. Well, I don't have to, because I don't want to. If we want to know the acceptance, the response of the Father's heart and love to us, we have to acknowledge and repent. And that's a hard thing to say in the church today because people don't want to. We don't want to acknowledge that we're not the exception in eternity to God's rules and regulations. We want everything He has for us with none of the conditions that are required to maintain them. We need to be willing to say, Father God, I turn from my own way to yours. Amen? And lastly and fourthly, the Father wants to reinstate us. And when the Son had done that, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. When the Son confessed, look what happens. The Father puts a ring on his finger or a robe over his shoulders and shoes on his feet. The ring represents reinstatement to partnership with the Father, the family authority and crest. It's his way when he returns of back being business with God. See, God doesn't make us second-class citizens. When we come back, when we acknowledge we've been away, when we acknowledge that we've been battling something on our own rather than giving it over to God, God doesn't say, okay, well, I'm gonna, you're, you're going to have to go on B team for six months. You know, we'll put you over here, and, and, and you'll, you'll still slide into heaven, but, you know, you, you wasted those gifts I gave you. No. This shows the heart of God. He immediately brings him back into the family. He immediately comes back and covers and, and gives him the ring. He's back in business with dad. And God is saying through the lips of his own son, if you'll come back to me, I will reinstate the possibilities I have always had in mind for you. God, let me hear, hear me say this well. God has no plan B, when you come back to God, you go back to plan A. He doesn't make you, well, you were gone a long time. Oh, you know, yeah, your reputation not what it was. I really like to have done what I really planned to do with you, but you know, you blew it, so therefore, you're going to have to go to C team. Now, I'll get you off the bench once in a while, but you're back to C team because you really blew it. No. God doesn't put anybody on C or B or D. He puts them back onto A. I will reinstate the possibilities I had in mind for you, just as the Father is doing here. He's re-enfranchising his son in the family business. The ring is the family authority. The robe is the family identity. Over his shoulder, all the way down to the ankles. It's a robe of dignity. It was the Father covering whatever had been shame or nakedness of the past. Loved ones, God, Father God desires to restore us to full stature. Not half stature, to robe us with the beauty of what we were made to be. To robe us with the beauty of what we were made to be. Now can I get more than one amen? 
We need to understand that when we'll come back to God, when we'll repent, when we'll take those areas that we've been working on by ourselves, when we've been struggling over by ourselves, and God is saying, bring that to me. I've been waiting and watching. I've been wondering, when are you going to come? Bring them to me. I just thought of a, a, a story that I've, that I've heard. It's a true story. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, do you know the name? Okay. Born probably at the turn of the century, that'd be the 19th, the 20th. And big deal, born in a city, and the big thing in that time was the circus. Boy, when the circus came to town, that was something. And Norman Vincent Peale was in an alley, and he had found a stogie that had got thrown away. He's about 8, 10 years old. And it had, you know, still pretty good stogie. So he fired it up, and he's reading the circus poster. They put up posters, and circus is coming to town. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees his dad walk across the end of the alley. Well, it takes and stuffs the... The stogie in his pocket. His dad comes down the alley and uh, Norman Vincent Peale, the little boy, Dad, Dad, the circus is coming to town. The circus, Dad, can I have a dime? Can I have a dime to go to the circus? And he looks at his son and he says, Norman, do not make requests with smoldering, smoldering disobedience in your pocket. You know, a lot of times God says, I want to take care of that for you. But we've got that smoldering disobedience. We've got that thing that we're going to work out. We're going to figure out. The Father wants to reinstate us to everything that He's originally intended. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are. God is not done with you. Your life does not go to track B or track C if you'll give it back to God completely. Father, God deserve, desires to restore us to full stature, to robe us with the beauty that we were made to be. And the shoes in the ancient culture represent an end to the time of weeping and mourning of the past. When people would weep and mourn, they wouldn't wear shoes. They would take their shoes off. The shoes on his feet, the weeping and mourning is over. It's time for celebrating. Loved ones, perhaps it's time to come home for some of you. Perhaps it's time to come back to the Father in repentance and be reconciled and healed and made whole. Perhaps it's time to acknowledge that area of your life that you're struggling with and you keep repenting for, that God says, bring it to me. I've known about it all along. That smoldering disobedience that's burning a hole in your leg, in your life. God's heart towards us is always towards us in love. His heart towards us is always towards us in care. His heart towards us is always towards us in healing. If we'll just come, acknowledge He's never lost hope. He's never given up on you. He's always looking your way. And if you'll repent, He'll respond and restore to the original plan. Amen? Why don't we stand?